This video is about vectors. A vector is a quantity with a direction and a magnitude, and at GCSE level the direction can become very important. We can represent vectors graphically using an arrow. The length of the arrow is the magnitude of the vector, that's the size of the vector. And the direction of the arrow is the direction of the vector. It doesn't matter where we draw a vector, if the length of the vector is the same and the direction of the vector is the same, then it's the same vector. So in this picture here, the u and the v are the same vector. Now believe it or not, you've been adding and subtracting vectors for years since you were in primary school. A vector of 5 to the right plus a vector of 3 to the right is a vector of 8 to the right. And this is usually how you learn to add up using a number line. So 5 plus 3 is 8, and you can see clearly that those are the same length and in the same direction. The only difference now is that our vectors have units, so they represent physical quantities. In this example, the vectors are forces, and here the vectors are velocities. So what about subtracting vectors? Well again, the same mathematics you learnt in primary school apply here. a minus b is the same as a plus minus b. A minus vector is the same as a plus vector, but in the opposite direction. Now in the previous example, we started the second arrow at the end of the first arrow, so we do exactly the same thing here. So you can see A starts here, moves to here, and then we add minus B to it, it brings us back to here. And so A minus B is this small arrow here. If A was a vector to the right that is 5 long, and B was a vector to the right that was 3 long, then A minus B is a vector to the right that is 2 long. And you can see that in this diagram. And of course this is exactly the way you did maths when you were very young. Starting from 0, 3 to the right, add 2 to the left. And the resultant would be 1 to the right. Now these are one-dimensional vectors, and of course these numbers, they could be any quantity that has a direction, force, velocity, momentum, for example. So what about two-dimensional vectors? Well, let's take an example. Here's a free-body diagram showing some body which is experiencing three newtons of force downwards, perhaps that's its weight, and two newtons of force to the right, perhaps it's being pushed somehow. And let's say we want to find what the resultant force is. The resultant force is what we get when we add the forces together. And the resultant vector is what you get when you add two vectors together, whether that vector is velocity or displacement or momentum or whatever. Now, a common mistake is to say 3 plus 2 is 5. That's OK in one dimension, but we're now in two dimensions. Don't forget, these vectors can be drawn anywhere. We can move them around the page. And remember how we add vectors together. We add vectors together by starting the second vector on the end of the first. So let's redraw the 2 newton vector on the end of the 3 newton vector. You can see there with the wonders of technology I've just copied that 2 newtons and put it down there. I could just as easily have copied the 3 newtons onto the end of the original 2 newtons. To make it clear that this 2 newton vector down here is just the recopied version of the first one, I'm going to change its colour. OK, so this is the 2 newtons drawn on the end of the 3 newton force. So the resultant will be connecting the start of the 3 newton to the end of the 2 newton. Now if we're using a scale diagram, we can measure what that length is. And so perhaps we use one centimetre is one newton, we just measure how many centimetres long that resultant vector is, and we can use that to determine how many newtons the resultant vector is. But notice this is a right-angled triangle, and that means we can use Pythagoras. Pythagoras is that the square of the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the squares of the other two sides. So the magnitude of the resultant vector in this case rounds to 3.6 newtons. The direction of the vector could either be given as a direction to the vertical or the direction to the horizontal. So let's start by looking at the vertical. We could say that this vector is so many degrees anti-clockwise to the vertical. Now how do we find this angle? Let's label the angle alpha. Well, we know that tan of alpha is going to equal the opposite divided by the adjacent. 
So that's basic trigonometry. And so the angle alpha is equal to the arc tan of 2 over 3, which is just a little bit less than 34 degrees. If I was using a scale diagram, I could have measured this angle by using a protractor. But if I am doing a scale diagram, I must make sure my diagram is large as possible so that any errors in my measurement have as small an impact as possible on my accuracy of my result. And I have to make sure I've written my scale somewhere so I don't forget what that is. The scale is going to be very important. So we found the resultant vector, in this case a resultant force, by putting the 2 newton force on the end of the 3 newton force. But could we have done it the other way around? Well, the answer is yes, we could. Here you can see I've copied the 3 newton force onto the end of the 2 newton force. And just as before, the resultant will be the beginning of the 2 newton to the end of the 3 newton. You'll notice that the resultant is exactly the same as it was before. Just as before, we've got a right angled triangle. Because the lengths are the same, the hypotenuse will be the same length. And the angle here is the angle of the resultant vector to the horizontal. Let's call that beta. The tan of an angle is equal to the opposite divided by the adjacent. So the angle beta equals the arc tan of 3 over 2, which is just a little bit more than 56 degrees. Now if you have two vectors that are not at right angles, you can still use a scale diagram. First of all, as accurately as you can, draw your diagram, and then follow the same rules as last time. Redraw one arrow on the end of the other. What you can actually do is redraw both of the arrows on the ends of the other one, and you end up with a quadrilateral. The quadrilateral is in fact a parallelogram. If we label these vectors, B and A, remembering that A, the vector, just tells you the direction and the magnitude, but not where you draw the vector, then A plus B is the same as B plus A. A plus B is down the bottom of A, then on the end draw B, and you end up here. B plus A is down to the end of B, then go down for A, and you end up in exactly the same place. They're the same vector. So by scale diagrams, you'll be able to calculate what the magnitude, or measure what the magnitude and the direction of that resultant vector is. But there is another way, without having to draw the scale diagram, and that is to break a vector, for example in this case B, down into two components one which is parallel to A and one which is perpendicular to A. What we can then do is add the parallel component of B to A and then we can use Pythagoras. I'll show you what I mean. I've added here two vectors. B with the perpendicular symbol is perpendicular to A and B with the parallel symbol, these two vertical parallel lines, is parallel to A. And I hope you can see that B perpendicular plus B parallel is B. If I just take a little arrow to indicate what I mean. B perpendicular plus B parallel is B. Well, B's now served its purpose. I've got the two components. And remember, vectors can be drawn anywhere, as long as they're the right length and in the right direction, which means I could redraw them like this. And there would be absolutely nothing wrong with doing that. So now I have a right angled triangle again, with the resultant vector being A plus B parallel component plus B perpendicular component. And it's exactly what we had last time. But now I have a right angled triangle, which I'm showing here. And so we have a length of the triangle here, we have another length of the triangle here, and we know that the hypotenuse is going to be the square of the sum of the, or the square root, sorry, of the sum of the other two squares. So let's write that down. This length here is A plus the parallel component of B. This length here is just the perpendicular component of B. And so this length is going to be the square root of the perpendicular component of B squared plus A plus the parallel component of B, all squared. Of course, that's all under that square root. And that's going to be the magnitude of my resultant vector. And I would find the angle, which I'll call gamma. I will find the angle by using the arctan, just as we did before. Gamma would equal to the arctan, 
or tan to the minus 1 if you prefer that notation, of the opposite, which in this case is going to be the perpendicular component of B, divided by the adjacent, which is A plus the parallel component of B. Now that's really, really complicated. And at GCSE level, you will not be expected to go quite as complicated as that. But you will have to do scale diagrams, and there's nothing wrong with looking at this already. It shows why there's some value in finding components of vectors, and that is something you need to do for your GCSE level. So let's just go through finding components of vectors. Now, as we've already discussed, a vector can be broken down into smaller components. Perpendicular components, perhaps, but they don't have to be. And any vectors that add together to make a resultant vector is considered a component. So here's a wacky example. Z here is my resultant vector, and it's made by summing A, B, C, D, and E. Of course, this is a very, very wacky example, and there are far more sensible components that we could break Z down into. For example, A and B. A plus B would equal Z. Perpendicular components are helpful because we can use trigonometry, we can use Pythagoras. Remember your rules of angles. This angle is equivalent to this angle. And so if you know the angle clockwise that Z is from the horizontal, in this example, you also know the angle within this right angle triangle. Reasons for breaking a vector into components include its being easier to add components of vectors together, uh, but also perhaps you want to know the component of a vector in a particular direction because you're only interested in the effect of that vector in that direction. And I'll give you an example. The ramp is theta degrees to the horizontal. The ball is acted upon by two forces. The weight of the ball, labelled mg, mass times gravitational field strength, is indicated here. Of course, that acts directly down. But the ball doesn't fall directly down. It falls in the direction of the ramp, which means it's accelerating the direction down the ramp. And that means the resultant force is in the direction down the ramp. Of course, we need to work out what that resultant force is. So I suppose what we really want is the component of the weight which is parallel to the ramp. And there we have it, a nice right-angled triangle, with the component of the weight acting down the ramp I've labelled here F. And the angle within this right-angled triangle, this angle here, is also theta, the same as the angle of the ramp. And so the component of force parallel to the ramp is mg sine theta. We used our trigonometry and we resolved our vector into two components this component being the interesting one in this case. But what of the other component? Well, the component that is perpendicular to the ramp is not causing any acceleration down the ramp. And that's because there's an equal magnitude force in exactly the opposite direction to that component here, which is the normal reaction force. This force and this force cancel each other out. So the resultant force is just the force down the ramp, and the ball accelerates down the ramp as we'd expect. OK, we've covered a lot in this video, and it's been tricky to get through it all. So feel free to watch the video again if there's parts that you don't quite follow, and you can always ask uh, if you want some more guidance.